Father, thank you for each of us here who can say, we behold you, in other words, see you with the eyes of faith, reigning over your creation with the risen Lord Jesus. And if we can say that, it is only because you've opened our spiritual eyes. So we pray that through your word and your spirit tonight, you would give us clearer spiritual sight or sight for the first time, and that you would equip us to take your word to others so that they might see too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. The first person I remember getting absolutely nowhere with talking about Jesus uh, was a university friend called Richard who was studying philosophy. And uh, I would invite him to a talk on something like um, how strong is the evidence for God. And Richard would say something like, Ian, <coughs> Ian, I'm sorry, that would only irritate me because I disagree with the basic categories of the question. And I would wander away, try to work out what were the basic categories of the question, let alone what was wrong with them. And it felt like we were on different planets and um, I had no idea really how to communicate with him. And if you're a Christian, that feeling will be familiar. And you may have it this week as you sit in a seminar on gender theory or work with colleagues who think that science has disproved God or chat to a Hindu uh, at the Globe Cafe next door tomorrow night. And tonight's passage in our Acts series deals with how to talk with people whose beliefs seem to put them on a different planet from us. So I've called this Taking Jesus to Other Planets. So would you turn in the Bibles in the seats to page 926, which will get you to Acts 17. And as you're doing that, uh, let me remind you what we saw last week in the first part of this chapter, page 926, Acts chapter 17. So here's a picture. Uh, there in the picture is Paul, who we saw preaching to his fellow Jews, who were basically on the same planet, uh, but some distance away. So next picture, that red circle there stands for the planet that Paul was on for his world view, planet Bible. The Bible understood with Jesus as the key to it. And then next picture, that yellow circle stands for the worldview of his fellow Jews, which is also the Bible, but this time not understood with Jesus as the key to unlocking it. So in fact, ultimately misunderstood, but there was still good overlap between their worldview and Paul's. For example, like him, they believed in one personal creator, God. Like him, they believed that something had gone badly wrong in the world. But unlike him, they didn't, they didn't understand that they were part of what had gone wrong um, or that Jesus had to die and rise again for them to be forgiven and put right. So Paul's job with them was to clear up their misunderstandings of the Bible and show them that they needed Jesus. And, and that may be something that you do even this week for someone with a Christian background who's not yet come to faith in Jesus. But tonight, we're going to see how Paul talked to people who were just on a different planet. Because having been run out of Thessalonica and Berea, he holed up in Athens and looked down to verse 16, Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that Silas and Timothy, his fellow evangelists at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols, in other words, full of statues of the Greek and Roman gods housed in temples where people brought offerings hoping to get the gods on their side. So if you had a cruise coming up, you would offer to the sea god, Neptune. If you wanted a romance to work out, you would offer to Aphrodite. If you wanted help in battle, Ares or Zeus, and for exam time, maybe Hermes, the god of communication. So here's the picture of the Athenians. They believed in multiple gods who each controlled a different slice of life and each had their idol statues and temples so that you knew where to contact them. And the average tourist in Athens saw all that architecture and, and, and sculpture and said, amazing, 
whereas Paul thought appalling. Verse 16 again. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And provoked is the same word that the Old Testament used of God being provoked when people worshipped other gods instead of him. And Paul feels that same righteous indignation and jealousy for God as he sees God being totally misrepresented and dishonoured. Do you ever feel that as you look around the church landscape today? Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the, de and the devout persons. Remember, they were always his first priority, just like helping people who still have some Bible background will always be a priority for us. But read on. He also reasoned in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Um, and don't think Granger Market with the kind of fruit and vegetables and all the rest of that. This was more like outside your student union or speaker's corner in Hyde Park. This is where people would try and buttonhole you to persuade you of their worldview. This is where Socrates had hung out just a, a few years before in his day. So verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with Paul. And in those days, philosophy, it wasn't the kind of rarefied subject that my friend Richard was doing. A philosophy was just a worldview. In other words, a, a set of beliefs to help you make sense of life and work out how to live it well. It was more grounded, if you like. So now into my picture, uh, we can add a bunch of philosophies. And so next picture, there is Paul's worldview in the red. Again, planet Bible from which he's trying to tell people about Jesus. And next picture, there are the Athenians' worldviews, a whole bunch of them. And they are on such different planets that there is so little overlap that at first they, they didn't understand Paul at all. Look on to verse 18. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? So they're, they're just dismissive and rude. You know, we don't understand him, so he must be an idiot. So if that's happened to you, you're in good company. Read on. Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's because the Greek for resurrection is anastasis, from which we get the girl's name Anastasia. So Paul's on about Jesus and his death and resurrection. They totally misunderstand him. They're thinking he's talking about these two gods, Jesus and Anastasia, presumably a, a married couple like Zeus and Hera. So if you've ever tried to explain the gospel and just been totally misunderstood, again, you're in good company. On to verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. That was the city council which basically vetted everything preached in Athens, and they had the power to cancel you. So cancel culture is absolutely nothing new. Saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said... And this is one of the summaries that Luke, the writer of Acts, gives of how the apostles preached the gospel. So in Acts chapter 2 and 13, he gives a summary of how the apostles preached to Jews, in other words, people with Bible background. Here, he gives a summary of how Paul preached to people with no Bible background. And it is only a summary. It takes, what, two minutes to read? Paul probably went for two hours in the Areopagus. So these are just Luke's bullet points, if you like, sermon notes, from which we can get some principles for taking the gospel to other planets. Here's principle number one. Our aim should always be to get to Jesus. Our aim should always be to get to Jesus. Why do I start with that? Well, some people say that Paul here abandoned simply preaching Jesus and his death and resurrection, and went all intellectual because he was in the philosophical and cultural capital of Europe and he wanted to impress them. And he was a little bit intimidated. 
That is clearly not true if you just read carefully. Look at the very end of verse 18. What was he doing that made the Areopagus want to vet him in the first place? Preaching, Jesus, and the resurrection. Business as usual. But Paul knew that if you preach Jesus and his death and resurrection to people with no Bible background at all, it makes no sense. So you have first to sketch the Bible background and then put Jesus against it. And sketching the, the Bible background is really what Paul does in most of this speech. But just skip down to verse 30 to see where he's aiming. Verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, that's Jesus, whom he's appointed, and of this he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul did not abandon preaching Jesus here. He was aiming all the time to get to Jesus, and that should be our aim too. That's principle number one. Trouble is, at least in my experience, people are not raising Jesus in conversation with me. So principle number two, we need to find points of contact. We need to find points of contact. Look on to verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. And that is his point of contact. That's what he goes for. I said the Athenians made offerings to different gods for different areas of life, Neptune for your cruise, Aphrodite for your romance and so on. But this was the problem for them. What, is, what if there was a God that you'd overlooked, whose name you didn't even know? and who might throw some really bad fortune at you because you had failed to offer him, you know, what he he wanted. You, You hadn't rubbed his lamp like you should have done. And Paul saw this altar to the unknown God uh, as admitting that really God was unknown to them. They were spiritually in the dark because they had that altar as well just to kind of cover all eventualities, just to be on the safe side. And so end of verse 23, he says, what therefore you worship as unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And that could sound appallingly arrogant, couldn't it? Except for the fact that Paul would have been the first to say, look, God would still be unknown to me if he had not made himself known in Jesus. And that is where we're coming from if we're Christians, isn't it? We are saying... We would not know God unless he had made himself known in Jesus, unless he'd been here on this planet in the person of his son. And that's the only reason we have something to say, something to proclaim. It's not our ideas, it's something God has done. So that's principle number two. We need to look for points of contact. So, for example, a a while back, a hairdresser, that I'd got to know. There was no one else in the shop, and suddenly she let her guard down completely. She said, I've been drunk all weekend. She said, in fact, Ian, the truth is, I live for the weekend so that I can get hammered and escape the fact that life is completely meaningless. And that is like the Athenians admitting that God was really unknown to them, her admitting that life is meaningless. And that was my point of contact. That was an invitation to say why I don't think it is. Principle number three, we need to get across crucial Bible background before people can understand Jesus. We need to get across crucial Bible background before people can understand Jesus. And most of that is in the Old Testament. So look down to verse 24 to see where Paul begins. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. So Paul goes all the way back to Genesis 1. Because if we're going to tell people that God sent Jesus into this world and that Jesus is God's son, they've got to know what we mean by God. What do you mean when you come out with that word, 
Because, for example, the Stoics in verse 18 believe that everything and everyone is part of God. So they'd have been very comfortable as Hindus. That's pantheism, if you like, jargon. So they needed to know that by God, Paul meant the one personal creator, God, who was completely different from everything and everyone he'd made, not part of it at all, although completely involved in it, and that he was Lord of it all. So it's not parceled up between Neptune and Epaphrodite and all the others. Just the one personal creator God in control of the whole show. Now, Paul doesn't quote Genesis here. After all, he's talking to people who don't recognize the authority of the Bible. So that that doesn't carry much weight. But he does communicate Genesis here. And, and that's one of the arts of evangelism. You don't have to be quoting the Bible, but you've got to be communicating what it's saying in language that people can understand. Verse 24 again. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So Paul challenges their worldview with the Bible worldview. He says, you Athenians, you think you've somehow got your gods. You know, like rabbits in a hutch, if you like, genies in a lamp. And that you can control them by offering them what they need. Because there they are in, in, in the temples. And he's saying, doesn't something tell you that the real God has got to be infinitely bigger than that? Does that really make sense? Doesn't something tell you that if God is God, you can't control him because we didn't make him, he made us, which means we depend on him for our needs, but he doesn't need anything from us. And it means he's in complete control of everything, including our lives, but we we can't control or manipulate him one inch and so Paul's moving from getting the truth about God clear to getting the truth about us clear and that is a good thing for us to talk about as we as we speak to people who are on other planets talk to them about what it means to be human what what do you think a human being is what do you think it means to be human do you think we're any different from the animals why why not Look on to verse 26. And this God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So he's planned history and nations and cultures. And that is a great point of contact with people who seem to be on another planet because it means you can walk up to anyone anywhere of any belief and say, you are here and you're living the life you're living because of this one personal creator God who actually wants to relate to you that's what verse 27 goes on into why did God make human beings well verse 27 so that they should seek God and he made them in the hope that they might feel their way towards him and find him that they should seek God means that God meant us to want relationship with him the assumption behind verse 27 is that we don't and that we don't start out life in the relationship with him that we were made for in other words verse 27 assumes genesis 3 and the fall that moment when the first human pair said to god you know we we don't want relationship with you because we think personal autonomy is going to deliver a better life So where verse 27 talks about the hope that they might, et cetera, et cetera, it's an unfulfilled hope. And where it says might feel their way towards him, that's the word the Bible often uses elsewhere for sadly blind people feeling their way in the dark, completely lost. And so verse 27 is not an optimistic verse. It's saying what God wants us to do, but what we actually never do unless he intervenes in our lives. 
individually. Read on verse 27. Paul says, And yet, he's actually not far from each one of us, for, and here he quotes some of their own writers, quote, In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, quote, for we are indeed his offspring. So <laughs> we're the ones who've moved away from God. And ironically, we're the ones who are always saying, why doesn't God make himself obvious? Why is he playing hide and seek? But Paul's saying he's not. He's, he's not far from each one of us. We've moved spiritually and morally but he's still there all the time, keeping us alive, directing the course of our lives, and always thinking of us like a parent, even if we never give him a thought. So Paul th thought that was the minimum crucial amount of Bible background you need before people will begin to understand Jesus. God, creation, humanity made to relate to God but turning away, and yet, amazingly, God still wanting relationship with us. Finally, principle number four. We need to get to Jesus' death and resurrection and call people to respond. We need to get to Jesus' death and resurrection and call people to respond. Let me say at this point, it is almost entirely unlikely that you will cover all of this over your next coffee with an interested friend. You know, you could, you could meet in Costa and you'd be high on caffeine, you know, in, in the time that it took you to talk about all of this. Paul had maybe, as I say, two hours, three hours unbroken in the Areopagus, whereas conversation, as you know, about Christian things is scrappy. It's like verbal scrabble. You know, you're just hoping to put something down and uh, the board suddenly changes and you're onto football or whatever it is and the chance is gone. But these are principles for the back of the mind. So look on to verse 29. Being then God's offspring, says Paul, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So we, we might talk about um, a son and offspring being the spitting image of his father. And the Bible says we're God's offspring in the sense that we are, Genesis 1 again, made in his image. So here's Paul's logic. He says to them, if we are made in God's image, then God must in some ways be something like us. You've got to be careful about that argument from us to God. But if we're made in his image, then God in some ways must be something like us. And since we're not lifeless, impersonal things made of gold or silver or stone, we shouldn't think that God is anything like that, anything like your idol statues. And as someone has said, idols are mental, not just metal. So when we say things like, well, I like to think that God is dot, 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 or my idea of God is dot, 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 or I cannot believe in a God who dot, dot, dot. We are likely to be as way off the mark of what God is like as they were. And Paul's big point here is that we are all, by nature, in the dark, ignorant, and needing God to make himself known. On to verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now. And when you meet that phrase in the New Testament, almost, almost always, it's the but now of the gospel. It's the but now. We've reached the point where Jesus has come and died and risen. But now that Jesus has been here as a human being to make God known, he commands all people everywhere to repent, to respond to that. Because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus, whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so he does finally get to Jesus. That's where he was heading all the time. And to how God, by raising Jesus from the dead, has said, he is my son, he is your rightful Lord, and you are all going to meet him as your judge.
And I think Paul would surely have added that Jesus died so that we could be forgiven back onto his side and be ready for meeting him that day without fear, without worry. And maybe he did say that, or maybe he was interrupted, and that was it. Because verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, because to to Greek thinkers, the idea of bodily life after death was a complete joke. That was nonsense from another planet. But others said, we'll hear you again about this. And so Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, presumably believed after a lot more conversation, after days, maybe weeks, these things take time, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite. That's extraordinary. And a woman named Damaris, who presumably is very high profile to be named, and others with him. So there we are. That's Paul's example of taking Jesus to other planets. He finds that point of contact. He, he paints in the crucial Bible background, and then he gets to Jesus, and he calls people to respond. Some people say, but it wasn't very effective, was it? The results were pretty minimal. I want to say I think the results were pretty amazing. You know, after just two hours of evangelism to people with absolutely no background, There are two household names in Athens who've come to faith and others with them, says Luke. And I think that is a reminder that even if the stats tell us that people with no Bible background take an average of however many months or even years it is to come to faith, God can bring people to faith in as short a time as he likes, even if they're living on a different planet. Let's pray. Father, we have to say that we feel more and more like Paul in Athens, uh, trying to get across what we know of you and of the Lord Jesus to people with little or no Bible background and with many different worldviews. And to be honest, many of us feel discouraged and tired by how hard that is, by being misunderstood, by being got at for what we believe, and by seemingly so little response. So, Father, thank you for the reassurance from Acts 17 that that's nothing new and that that's no obstacle to the gospel and to you bringing people to faith in Jesus. And we pray, please help us to understand the worldviews of those that we want to tell about Jesus. Help us to learn how to speak the truth of the Bible into their lives and help us to keep one another encouraged, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.